Hello. Hi, Welcome Shia. Welcome to coming in. Hi, Francesco. It's good to see you again. Happy Friday. Happy Friday. I think we'll wait a few more seconds and let people trickle in. Yeah. Um, it's good to see how her. people keep following us every every time. Yeah. It's good to see everybody in. Yeah. It's going to be nice to to talk today about this wonderful exhibition. And in two weeks, uh, we have our last talk of the semester. So we'll remind you all of that in the end. So I think maybe I'll begin. Um, welcome to Zooming In, everybody. Our bi-weekly conversation, curatorial conversations from the Magnus Collection of Jewish Art and Life. I'm Shir Gal Kuchavi, and joining me is Francesco Spagnolo, fearless Hello. curator. Every week I'll give you, every other week I'll give you a different title, Francesco. I'm going to keep <laughs> okay. it interesting. Sounds um, good. <laughs> just as a quick reminder, this is a Zoom, a Zoom webinar, so that means that all of our participants' videos are turned off but you can interact with us in two ways. If you have any technical questions, please use the chat button on the bottom of your screens and let us know whether there are any issues or also please let us know where you're zooming in from. And if you have any questions for us, please use the Q&A button on the bottom of your screen as well. As a quick reminder, the Magnus Collection is one of the largest Jewish museum collections in the world and one of the top three in the United States. It's the only one in the world associated with a major research university. We'll be presenting today for approximately 20 minutes. We always aim for 20 minutes, but sometimes we have a few extra topics we need to discuss, as a few of you already know. And we plan to leave a few minutes for questions in the end. Throughout the semester, we, were, we have been and will continue reflecting on different exhibitions presented by the Magnus over the last decade. Highlighting, highlighting how they will be re revisited in the context of a new exhibition which we hope to open in the fall called Time Capsules. Today, our topic is the beautiful exhibition Italia, an Island of Divine Dew, Italian Crossroads in Jewish Culture. And before we dive in today and think about all the different uh, connections and the different um, routes uh, taken of people taken who visited Italy and lived in Italy and all the different uh, wealth of materials that we have from Italy. I wanted to ask you, Francesco, since we kind of briefly talked about this in a completely different context a couple of weeks ago, if you can discuss or explain to us a little bit of the of the title, the, the chosen title, Italia. Is Italia, it yes. So uh, first of all, as, as somebody uh, I heard somebody say, before I begin to speak, let me say a few words. And uh, we, we've also, so week after week, we actually explore different exhibition and exhibition formats. And so in this case, this is a classic case of an exhibition that results from the expertise of the curator in charge. I've been studying Jewish Italy for some decades. Um, I think pretty much as I left Italy, physically left Italy, moved first to Israel and then the United States. I became a, a, an Italianist within Jewish studies. It's one of my main areas of, of research. I'm particularly interested in what happens inside synagogues. So it was a pleasure to, to, to mount an exhibition based on the Magnus holdings from Italy. Um, and there are so many, and we'll be talking about that as well. And, uh, and some of these, like the, the, the marriage contract we see in, in this slide is uh, really, really stunning too. Um, but um, I really try to apply my, my expertise and, and the way I, I understand uh, Italian Jewish culture and history to the holdings of the Magnus. And then it came time to, to, to come up with a title for the exhibition. The exhibition was presented in 2016, marking the year that marked the uh, 500th anniversary of the establishment of the ghetto in Venice, the Jewish ghetto in Venice, the place from where the word ghetto comes from, which then has had a, a, a very complex and continues to have a very complex history, uh, cultural history. And just like two weeks ago, we, we talked about an exhibition at the Magnus titled Gourmet Ghettos, uh, based on the fact that Berkeley, California has its own gourmet ghettos. It's a restaurant district that has been called that way. And finally, the name was put into question. So this is another pun 
uh, in the title, Italia, but it's an old pun. Uh, there are some sources that uh, take, a ba take back uh, to the fact that Italian Jews refer to the word Italia, which means Italy in, uh, in Italian. Uh, they refer to it spelling it in Hebrew, Italia. Uh, the T sound is with a tet, not with a tav. And if one takes the, the, the three syllables apart, Italia, uh, divided that way, um, in Hebrew, these are three Hebrew words. E means island. Tal means dew, as in the morning dew, but also the divine dew, the blessing of, of the dew, the blessing of nature on, 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 and on the human world. And Ya is one of the names uh, with, uh, in which in Hebrew one can refer to God. Uh, because of the, the first two letters of the tetragrammaton, the four-letter name of God, yud uh, So Italia means the, the an island of divine dew, and that became the title of the exhibition. It's, I'm not the first one to use this for, for an exhibition about Italy, but I think the first one may be in the United States. It requires a little bit of explanation, a little bit of footnotes. So before we start, we gave the footnote. Thank you for prompting that, Shir. Of course, and I really like that explanation, uh, and I love the usage of, of both Italian and Hebrew in the title. Mm -hmm. So we're going to continue to the second part of the title yeah. to talk about the Italian crossroads in Jewish culture. Yeah, well, uh, uh, this is one of my favorite maps. We actually used it a few months ago. We presented about one document. We'll see it in, 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 a, in a few slides, I believe, but uh, one document from the Magnus Collection, the travel to Venice, on the occasion of a big exhibition that uh, the city of Venice uh, put together to mark the 500th anniversary of the, of the Venice Ghetto in 2016. Uh, but um, this is a, one of my favorite maps of Italy, but it, it's, it's intended here to show the fact that Italy, especially starting in the 1500s, became a hub of Jewish, global Jewish migration. Uh, many different Jewish cultures and communities were represented in Italian ghettos, and one can even think about the fact that ghetto were, ghettos were created to sort of contain this uh, Jewish migration. Uh, uh, again, just a little bit of, uh, you know, very, very quick cultural history. Um, Italy is not just a nice place to visit, and hopefully it's going to be uh, possible to visit it again soon from the United States and, and abroad. Uh, but, uh, and everybody loves the food and the art, etc. But in the 1500s, which was really a pretty happening place. Uh, uh, international trade, banks, uh, were being invented essentially, uh, and um, and uh, and culture. You know what what uh, we refer to in, in English as the Renaissance. So with a French word, and in Italian we call Rinascimento. Uh, the rebirth of culture was taking place. It's not a not by chance because of a a, a, a the the fact that many factors were at work at once, and Jews were part of that picture, and it became a pole of attraction for Jews from all over the Mediterranean, Europe, etc. So we have Ashkenazi communities speaking Yiddish, we have Sephardic communities uh, from Iberia speaking Spanish and Portuguese, not so much Judeo-Spanish. This is a question that always comes up. Uh, did, did Italian Jews speak Ladino? Um, not really. Uh, actually, most Jews quickly abandoned their own um, uh, vernaculars in favor of the various Italian dialects, and even if they came from various parts of the world, really kind of blended in uh, uh, together, maintaining differences, blending in. It's, it's a very interesting uh, dynamic. A way to think about this and something that inspired the conversation around the, the exhibition and the frame the exhibition is the fact that this sort of global Jewish migration into the Italian peninsula since the 1500s is probably the earliest case of global Jewish cultural encounter before the mass migrations of Jews to the Americas, uh, later, of course, also to, to, to Australia. I'm, I'm saying this because I, I see in the chat that somebody is, is uh, writing from Australia and asking whether we're going to record the conversation we are and put it and posting it on YouTube every week. Thanks to Ross uh, Calter, uh, a student at UC Berkeley, who is behind the scenes making everything that we do happen on, on Zoom. So uh, to go back, um, uh, before mass migration to, to the Americas, and then of course to Palestine and Israel, this is the first case in Italy that we see of Jews of different cultures, different origins, different languages, foods, um, and, uh, and uh, of course rituals uh, coming together and having to negotiate 
uh, their differences under the global umbrella of Jewish peoplehood, what we would call today Jewish peoplehood. Um, so it's, it's an interesting case study, essentially. And that and was the idea of the exhibition. Yes, and it was heavily reflected in material culture and also in the linguistic sym symbiosis. So here yeah. we chose this beautiful example. Yeah, this I'll is a fairly, a fairly rare print, early 1700s uh, Venice. Uh, and uh, I think we have a, a, a more didactic slide coming up yeah. that shows how, ev although everything is printed in Hebrew script here, we have different languages. We have Hebrew in Hebrew, we have Spanish in Hebrew, so it's Spanish words written in Hebrew script. And we have, and it's circled in green on the left side of, of our screen, we also have Italian or Hebrew and Italian. The, 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 the word Venezia uh, is spelled in Hebrew, but it's the Italian word Venezia. And, and the name of the printer, Bragadin, is also spelled in Hebrew. And, and this is a classic example. And at the center, we have actually a print of Ashkenazi origin. So it's really an example of this uh, 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 multiple cultural encounter. And, uh, and there are many uh, of that kind in, in the collection and many of the documents we have about uh, Italian Jewish culture and history really um, describe the world in which different cultures come together. Not just the Jewish ones, of course. Bragadin, the printer, was, of course, they were Christian printers in Venice. And this is an example of the collaboration between Jews and Christians in uh, Italy. The layout of the Talmud page, by the way, also of the rabbinic Bible. So essentially the idea of the core text at the center and like in a hypertext, it works very well today with computers, but uh, back then it worked okay with movable type. Um, essentially the idea of the core text at the center, the commentaries as a corollary of the layout out of the page. This uh, layout, which uh, in the Jewish world and beyond is taken for granted as the classical layout of the Talmud page of the, of the Bible page was actually conceived in the 1500s in, uh, in, uh, in Venice on the Italian peninsula. Really very much the, the result of this encounter of global Jewish cultures and Jew global Jewish intellectuals meeting in this case, Italian or other uh, printers and uh, global encounters of, of technologists of the time. Um, so it's, uh, it's an example of how these global encounters really impact culture on the world at large. And of course, we have the beautiful example of another encounter between rabbis, doctors, uh, community members, uh, academics. Um, Francesco, would you like to say? Yeah, we, 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 so again, if, if the people are watching us and want to uh, uh, scavenge through our, our YouTube account, they will find a, a conversation we had on Zoom last fall, specifically about this, uh, this uh, um, medical diploma. It's a university diploma. Uh, back in the day when academia, by the way, academia was being invented in Italy. And uh, the university diplomas had a language that according to a historian Robert, Robert Bonfield, inspired the language used by rabbis to write rabbinical graduation diplomas. So there is a, a, a really a symbiosis and the idea that rabbis are essentially scholars and not just uh, spiritual leaders, religious leaders emerges from, from all of this. Uh, we, we, we kind of dissected this document back then, so we are not going to do it uh, uh, today. But what we see here is, is, a, is a local artist who painted a lot of these university diplomas for um, all kinds of students, including the minority of Jewish students who were admitted to the University of Padua, one of the very few university, earliest universities to admit Jews um, um, as students. And so the template is the same, but the, the, uh, the, um, the content changes. In this case, uh, we have instead of uh, uh, priests or religious sim symbols that we find in Christian uh, in, in medical diplomas for Christian students, uh, we find the rabbi, maybe a doctor, and, uh, and references, of course, to the Jewish identity of the, of the student uh, in the text of the, of the diploma. Again, as an example of how uh, Italy really is an interesting place for, to study how Jewish and non-Jewish cultures uh, work together, sometimes even well. And this is, of course, side by side, like you said, with Christian elements. So we'll Absolutely. come back to that yeah. in, a, in a minute. Mm -hmm. yeah. Another interesting uh, 
template of something that seemingly originates from Italy is the idea of illustrating the uh, scrolls of Esther. So the scroll of Esther is actually the biblical book of Esther is one of the books of the Hebrew Bible. Uh, and it's the story of Esther and the attempted persecution of Jews in, 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 in Persia, in ancient Persia. And um, it's, a, it's a, not only a fascinating story, but it's part of Jewish ritual. It's the, 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 the story of Esther is read from a scroll, uh, is read in synagogue uh, the eve and then the morning of the day of Purim, the festival of Purim in the springtime. And it seems that uh, Italy is the place where the idea of adding illustrations to the, to the scroll of the story of Esther uh, came about, and then that idea expanded into, into the Jewish world, similar in a way to what, what we were describing earlier about the layout of the Talmud page. So uh, the, the scrolls became graphic novels, and there are many theories about why, not so many theories, there are a few theories about why uh, the, this template, this idea of illustrated the scroll of Esther uh, emerged uh, uh, at that time, a classic explanation is that this is a graphic novel for non-Hebrew readers. Another classic explanation is, is us answering the question, who are the non-Hebrew readers in, uh, in the synagogue? And usually the answer is women who were not uh, schooled in Hebrew like, like uh, men. We know that uh, Hebrew schools were essentially mandatory for boys, but not for girls. Uh, sorry, Shir. <laughs> Seems like you made up uh, and... Thank all the gods for that. Yeah. Uh, and uh, and uh, but the, the truth is that uh, in in the early modern period, we know that many Jewish women in Italy were quite well educated. Some of them were poets, literati, uh, um, and even community leaders in all kinds of ways, and uh, leaders in financial enterprises and so on. Um, and so it's a little I'm a little doubtful of this idea that the illustrations are are were, were done for women in the synagogue. Uh, maybe some of the women couldn't read, of course, the children couldn't read yet read Hebrew, uh, but also what we know from historical sources is that the synagogues inside the ghettos, and especially on Purim, when people could, it's around the time of the Christian carnival, people could wear disguises, uh, people could sneak into ghettos, even if they were not Jewish, and, and go to synagogue, and synagogues were a, a destination, a cultural uh, destination at the time. Uh, they are today, but uh, today they're empty of people for the most part, they are sites of tourism. Mm -hmm. uh, at that time, it was a different type of tourism, maybe, of cultural tourism. And so I'm, I'm, I'm kind of oriented to think about these illustrations are directed at, at all non-Hebrew readers, including non-Jews who were in the synagogues, and you know they were there. Mm -hmm. So uh, we brought these uh, two beautiful ketubas really as examples to show the counter influence or the inner relationship between Christians and Jews, once again, kind of like in the synagogue context. And Francesca, would you like to, to continue and I will take it over for the next part or? Yeah, well, these, these are also examples of, of cultural integration. If we look at these uh, beautiful marriage contracts, first of all, again, the idea of, in, of, uh, of decorating and painting uh, marriage contracts also seems to have roots in Italy, and that's something that we would need to think about further. Uh, but uh, these examples that we see are pretty amazing in terms of integrating themes that are um, even uh, theologically in opposition with uh, with uh, Jewish the Jewish religion uh, religious world. Uh, on the left, we have. A, a ketubah, which is illustrated with uh, Greco-Roman gods. Uh, there is the, the, the goddess of Concordia, uh, Hymen, which are, you know, all ensure peace and, and, and peace in the home, but also Cupid or Eros at, at the top. Uh, and, and also their, their bodies are exposed, which is not really so acceptable in terms of uh, rabbinic thinking, but seems to be a practice. Uh, and so is, and these uh, on the right, we have, uh, there are a couple of examples of the Magnus, there are several of, of Ketubot with the same template um, around, uh, around collections in the world. 
uh, they're all from Lugo, a very, very interesting uh, place in, in the northeast, the, the south of the northeast of Italy, near Bologna, just to, for, for those who know Italian geography. And, um, and, uh, but what's interesting is the heart, which is not the heart of love. I think it's really the sacred heart. It's a, it's a, it's a Catholic symbol, not just Christian, a Catholic symbol that uh, makes its way into, so most likely, a, and I think there are good studies on this, uh, more, 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 most likely, uh, uh, Catholic artisans making these uh, some of these uh, ketubot. The one on the left, though, is actually by a Jewish artist who was probably also a publisher printer, uh, David Passigi. He signed it uh, at the end. The fact that they're illustrated may also be an attempt to give visible respectability to Jewish um, life, the Jewish life cycle, and especially marriage. Many of the of these uh, um, marriage certificates also bear. And we have a couple of those in the collection, uh, bear inscriptions from the secular officers who were certifying the, the, essentially the civil validity of the Jewish wedding uh, in, 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 in civil institutions. So they really are public documents in some ways, and they have to look good as public documents. Mm -hmm. And we continue to look at Hanukkah lamps. Again, another topic that we explored heavily in the, in the last semester, if any of you are looking back at uh, our YouTube page. And once again, we have two beautiful Hanukkah lamps that, as you can see, have are very heavily decorated, very beautifully decorated with the same top the same topic that we raised in the in the last slide with the ketubas with the marriage contract, the uh, the gods, um, and of course the the puti, the, uh, the the angels that are the guardian. The little putti and faces, the sweet angels uh, that represent sometimes Cupid and sometimes just little uh, love uh, issue ideas of love, and of course the decorative floral arrangements on top, looking as if it's some kind of an arch architectural um, uh, decoration for a building or for an exterior. You, you know what this reminds me, just as a as an Italian. You know, it's it's really anecdotal. I I. I... I must confess, I, I have not traced the shape of this uh, specific Hanukkah lamp yet. It will happen maybe at some point, but it actually um, it reminds me of the fountains in Rome. There are so many fountains exactly. that look like this, and so I, I always expected the, the the mouth of the puto at the center to spout water, yeah. uh, uh, if not oil, for the for the Hanukkah lamp. <laughs> uh, but again, you know, the other thing that's interesting here, both of these are from the Strauss collection and Siegfried Strauss. We've talked about him in our conversations, but uh, was a collector first in Germany and then in the United States and, and Magnus purchased uh, a good part of his collection in the late 1960s. And, uh, and uh, Zikri Strauss, like many collectors of, of his type and generation was trying to backdate um, objects in their collections as much as possible. Uh, the idea is that antiquity is, uh, is a good thing. And um, I'm not so sure, hence the brackets around the, the real, the centuries that these uh, items were made, I'm not sure, but I, I decided to, to for, for this presentation to preserve the, the dating of the collector rather than the dating of the Magnus. They're a little later than that. Uh, and they also probably um, point us to repurposing existing objects, maybe a tray on the left and, mm -hmm. um, and other decorative elements on the, on the right and, and turning them into Hanukkah lamps. Um, I see that there are a few questions that are coming in, in the chat. Uh, Shiri, I know you're not looking at that because yeah. you're sharing your screen, but uh, we'll, we'll get to them. Just, just, just we have a couple, couple more minutes. ideas. Uh, the questions are coming in the chat. If they can be in the Q&A, you use the button at the bottom of the screen that helps us kind of keep all of your questions in place. Uh, we just have a few more ideas to share uh, before we, we, we look at the many questions that are coming in. So of course, Italy was a place of, of also global, global connections between mm -hmm. Jews. Uh, the Jews of Italy is part of, an, of a bigger empire as part of another context. Mm -hmm. And here, this is the first example that we chose to, yeah. to show that. So, so you know, when we sh first showed that map of, of Italy with the various arrows showing migration from all parts of the, of the world at the time in the 1500s, we could have had another map that shows the, the migration out of it, or in any case, the connections between Jews who migrated from various uh, other diasporic communities into Italy, the connections with their communities of origin. In other words, the, the map of Italy itself is not enough to really describe 
the cultural history of the Jews of Italy. One has to expand at least into the Mediterranean, but perhaps also into the Americas. There are interesting links uh, there as well. This is a case of connection with the Eastern Mediterranean and was for a wedding of, in the Camondo family. We talked about the Camondo family. Again, for those of you who want to go to magnus.berkeley.edu and click on the YouTube icon, you'll get to our channel and find all of our past talks. We archive everything and share everything we can uh, with everyone. And so this is an example of a, the style is that of wedding poems and another very interesting style and bilingual wedding poems, Italian and Hebrew, another classic uh, uh, expression of Italian Jewish uh, culture, but exported into the Eastern Mediterranean, into Turkey. And there were Jewish communities, Italian synagogues in Turkey, in, in Salonika, across the Mediterranean, and um, the island of Corfu, and, uh, and, uh, and beyond. And here we go into exactly mm -hmm. that yeah. kind of an example. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, well, on top we have a, 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 a Torah pointer in Hebrew, Yad, for the hand, this, the shape of the hand is right there, pointing and an and A to read from the Torah scrolls in the synagogue. It's inscribed with the word Venezia. Um, when we inherited, we've actually received the gift of this, uh, this collection, we, we recatalogued it all. And I'm, I'm, I'm of the school that if the, if, the, if the word Venezia, Venice in Hebrew is written on this, on this uh, object, it's not because it came from Venice. Uh, it's not a label of provenance. It, 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 Venezia was the last name in, uh, among, among Jews of Italian origin or Italian connection in the Eastern Mediterranean. Uh, there is actually a very important Holocaust survivor who passed away a few years ago, Shlomo Venezia, who was one of the few survivors of the Zone der Commando in der Canal, gave very important testimony, whose last name was Venezia. And uh, so we, we, we know this as a family name. It could have been a family name. It could be a reference to other things, but it doesn't necessarily mean that this yard was made in Venice. Who, who knows? We don't have enough information about this. And then we have a very iconic object here from that was, you know, had the centerpiece. It's a tiny, tiny object. There's a spice box, but it's in the shape of an artichoke. And uh, the artichoke is probably the most famous, uh, and especially the carciofi alla Giudia, the Roman salad, so the deep fried artichoke. But there are many other Italian Jewish recipes for, for artichokes. Uh, but the artichoke is almost like a symbol. Uh, today, contemporary symbol of Italian Jewry as a way to connect uh, Judaism with food and therefore with Italy. But the connection, as we've explained, is much deeper and, and much older and, and more ingrained in culture. A couple of our last topics. Um, one of them, of course, and we can't, we can't go without a little bit of magic, a little bit of Jewish magic. Um, modern Jewish magic, as it came from from Italy and was uh, and inspired and was redistributed to other places out of Italy. So once again, those routes, those global routes of really and creating connections and relationships back and forth. Um, Francesca, would you want to add anything about these routes and the way that this, these kinds of amulets were distributed outside of? Well, I, I think the one important thing to 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 remember, and so the, these images are are more of a reminder of that for me today. Uh, is uh, that we can actually date around 1570, the arrival of Kabbalists from Sfat, from Safed in, in the Galilee, in the Upper Galilee, um, a place that actually just uh, uh, yesterday for, for the festival of Lagba Omer uh, showed a terrible, devastating accident with many losses of life. Uh, and uh, um, But from that area, emissaries of, of uh, the Kabbalist Moshe Cordovero reached uh, the shores of the Venetian lagoon and uh, started basically a central that uh, that propagated Kabbalistic ideas and practical magic and re reconceived early modern practical magic in, in, in a Kabbalistic vein and objects that really templates that went around the world. So what happens when lots of Jews from different cultures all merge in one place? Many different things can happen. And what happens in Italy also, as this, uh, this slide, again, we had a talk about this with our colleague from the Museum of Fine Arts, uh, uh, Simona Di Nepi uh, in Boston, who helped us navigate through these uh, Torah binders. And we have a few from the Magnus, all inscribed with name, names of women and, uh, and who are really identified as, as real people in synagogue life. And even though, as we know, they didn't have a speaking role, uh, they had a very important presence in communal life as well. Uh, and uh, they were among the pioneering 
benefactors, essentially philanthropists in, 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 in modern Jewish life in Italy. So there's a lot to learn from Jewish women in Italy. Uh, their prayer books are fascinating. And, um, but we, let's flip, we, we, we're going to take a, a couple extra take minutes. One minute. <laughs> uh, Shira, and this is going to flip over to you. Why is it that there's so much Italian Jewish cultural heritage in Jewish and other museum collections worldwide, Shira. It's the Magnus is not alone. We, we could easily, I could easily as a curator of the Magnus mount a very rich exhibition, just, just, just a few examples, uh, just with what's at the Magnus, but many, many important collections have a lot of Italian materials. How did it happen? This is really, Shira, your, your area of expertise. So. And of course, there are so many reasons that we've already discussed throughout the, the past 20 minutes. The, the ideas of exporting exporting goods from Italy into Italy, the interconnections, um, exporting Italian aesthetics. Italy, after all, was a center, was an artistic center, a cultural center, center for so many centuries. And objects were commissioned to both Christian and Jewish artists, mostly to Christian artists by Jewish patrons, because Jews were not able to participate in the guilds. Again, a topic for another talk um, at early times. But of course, these I, these beautiful aesthetic ideas that uh, you know that we see throughout Renaissance art, and of course later a lot of it through Baroque art and Rococo in 17th and 18th centuries. Uh, so it also pleased the eye, it pleased the European taste, um, and it also and we're also looking at objects that are very rich that are made from very, very um, expensive materials. So silver and gilded objects. And I'm not gonna take more of our times, but there are at least a few more reasons that I can count. I just chose a couple, two examples from other collections of what this one, beautiful one of a marriage contract from the Jewish Museum in New York. And I put it next to a muse, uh, an example from our museum on your left. And this beautiful example of, of our beautiful, one of our favorites, Hanukkah lamps, if I may say, so my, at yeah. least for, speak to my, for myself, uh, to the left. And on the right, um, almost a counterpart from the Israel uh, Museum collection in Jerusalem that, as you can see, both uh, have an emblem of different families. They're constructed and they're almost identical. So we're really just missing the glass, uh, the glass uh, places for the oil. Um, and of course, Israel, and we'll end with that. And I'll just say in one sentence, after World War II in the 1950s and throughout the 1960s, about 40 Torah arts and several synagogues from different small Jewish communities across um, Italy were transported to Israel. And today they are still uh, on view. They are used, many of the Torah arts are used in different communities from in Israel, from north to south, from from small synagogues to even there's one that I found in an in a, in IDF base uh, in Latrun. Uh, and these are two of, I think, of the most spectacular examples of whole synagogues that were, that were shipped to Israel. So we'll end to that, and we're happy to answer a few of the questions before we say goodbye. Yes. And, thank you. Uh, oh, thank and you. I well, forgot the most yeah. important question that was left <laughs> unanswered. <laughs> this is a key of a a great synagogue. We don't know which one that's part of the Strauss collection. And by the way, there was a question in, in the in the Q&A about whether the Strauss family is the same as the Strauss uh, dairy uh, enterprise. And uh, not to the best of our knowledge, there is no connection there. Then this is a, a question for Californians or from Californians. Uh, but uh, this this little key of a of a um, made my, I suspect of 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 a of a Torah ark. Um, is unidentified in terms of where exactly it came from. There is no marker of which, which city. So I'm always wondering whether maybe one day we'll reunite this key with one of the Torah arcs that were taken out of Italy uh, yeah. from synagogues that were abandoned but are no more because they're really, most of them are being restored. Uh, there is a lot of activity and a lot of public uh, funding to, to do that. And they're all opened uh, in, the, in, the, in the early fall for the European Day of Jewish Culture. There are over 40 locations in Italy between synagogues, uh, cemeteries, um, some of them with very important, important uh, gravestones and, and, and materials that are open to the public and, and, and people flock because I think uh, they are actually re-enacting an, an old tradition of, of connection between Jews and non-Jews in Italy right, by visiting synagogues. Uh, but that's again for another 
sorry, we have many people uh, logged in. We're closing the 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 uh, the 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 program. There are a few other questions. I'm going to go through them. Sure, if that's okay, so you Absolutely. don't have to you. go crazy with the screen share. Uh, but um, somebody's asking whether we have any any materials on Rachel Luzzato Morpurgo and her poetry. We do not. Uh, we do have materials from the Luzzato family, especially um, Shadal Shmuel David Luzzato and his son Isaiah. And uh, if one goes to the to the Magnus website and clicks on search the collection gets to the database and can find information about about those uh, manuscripts um, and uh, we also have a question about the term italki somebody is writing saying my grandfather told me our ancestors were not ashkenazi but italki an expression i've not i've almost never heard again italki italiani bene romi uh, sometimes even loazi are all terms used by Italian Jews to define themselves. Where do we find them? We find them in, in prayer books. And in the, in, in the beginning of prayer books, it will say, this is a prayer book according to the ritual of. And so we find Italki. Uh, and of course, in modern Hebrew, Italki means simply Italian. And Italkit is the Italian language, right? <laughs> and uh, there was also a very precious suggestion about the, the, um, the um, uh, the the um, the format of illustrated uh, Esther scrolls. This came through the chat, and uh, and uh, whether they're uh, they're similar in as an idea to uh, the illustrated Book of Days, personal prayer books in the in the Christian tradition. That's a very very good suggestion. Uh, the thing is that the Esther scrolls are illustrated very much like graphic novels, and we saw an example earlier. So they're really the illustration is not just to gratify the owner of the of the of the book, but really to tell the story for those who seemingly to tell the story for those who can't read it. Uh, so that gets me thinking in all kinds of ways. But uh, you know that thinking again is going to be offline, off Zoom. <laughs> thank you so much, Shir, for thank for you, all your questions, and your expertise. And thank you everybody for joining us, and please remember to join us in two weeks for a talk about Piast del Zistans, Echoes of Judea Capta from Ancient Points to Modern Art. Uh, which was in a 2018 exhibition. Um, so thank you, Ross Calter, our fearless uh, student and help and constant helper, who's always in back in the back helping us and monitoring us. And thank you all our viewers today for joining us. And have a wonderful weekend. Take care. See you in okay. two weeks. Goodbye.